Genres are a useful thing. They're essentially a loose collection of themes, images, ideas, plot points and tropes that we use to categorise stories. When someone says, I love science fiction, what they're really saying is, I love it when a story uses this collection of tropes to explore this collection of ideas. Some genres are here to stay, some genres barely make a blip on the radar, and some genres, like the screwball comedy, burn brightly for a little while before fading out. And if they're lucky, they'll leave a lasting imprint on the whole of cinema. So what is the screwball comedy? What are its tropes and what ideas does it explore? Why was it born and why did it fade away? Hello and welcome to 100 Years of Cinema. We'll be taking a look at at least one film each year from 1915 onwards to track the evolution of film over the last century. An offshoot of the comedy film and lying somewhere between a rom-com, a farce and a satire is the screwball comedy. The genre's classical period is loosely agreed to have spanned from 1934, starting with It Happened One Night, and ending sometime in the mid 50s. It's a fairly rigid story that involves a man and a woman from different social backgrounds. They take an instant dislike to each other, but through a bizarre set of circumstances, they're forced to work together. And as they resolve the problem, they fall in love. Their defining features are fast paced dialogue. Sometimes for your own sake, Red, I think you should have stuck to me longer. I thought it was for life, but the nice judge gave me a full pardon. Uh... And rapidly escalating plots with farcical and exaggerated situations. They tended to focus on the comedy of conflict. Conflict between principles, between ideologies, and between genders. The screwball comedy burst into existence with It Happened One Night in 1934. The film is universally beloved today, and it laid down the template for what would become one of the most popular genres throughout the 30s and 40s. But during filming, it was believed it was going to be a flop. It was a cheap production by Columbia Pictures, then considered to be a poverty row studio. Lead actress Claudette Colbert reportedly complained on the last day of shooting, I've just finished making the worst picture I've ever made. It was initially released to relatively few theatres with minimal publicity, and it garnered modest box office receipts. However, during the film's second run later that year, word of mouth began to spread, particularly from small towns. Despite its poor initial run, it became a surprise box office hit. That year, it was the first film in history history to win all five of the top Academy Awards. Something about the film spoke to the people of the time. Genre films can act as a kind of time capsule, allowing us to look at the social, economic and political circumstances that gave rise to their tropes and they can tell us something about the society that made them popular. It Happened One Night reflected the attitudes of the day and in doing so it laid the groundwork for every screwball comedy that would follow. Let's take a look at the tropes that were born with It Happened One Night, and what they can tell us about the world and the film industry of the 1930s and 40s. It Happened One Night tells the story of two people thrust together by unforeseen circumstances. Ellie Andrews is a self-assured society girl who knows exactly what she wants. In the opening scenes, we find out that she's eloped with a famous aviator against her father's wishes, and she simply won't be told what to do. She's forced to travel cross-country with Peter Warren, a working man who holds her with the utmost contempt. What makes you so disgustingly cheerful this morning? The whole premise of the film is based on the idea that men and women have very different roles and it causes trouble when either one oversteps their boundaries. The battle between the sexes tended to be a central driving force in the plot of most screwball comedies. The power dynamic varies from film to film, but what remains constant is that either by the end of the film, the differences between the male and female protagonists are reconciled, or they're accepted and they're recontextualized as the root of attraction. So why was this conflict between the genders such a dominant force in screwball comedies? Well, the screwball comedy emerged at a time of huge social upheaval. The US saw a huge influx of women entering the workforce, and for the first time, they were pitted personally, and sometimes professionally, against men. Employers find that women can do many jobs as well as men. Some jobs better. The roles of men and women were changing in society, and this was reflected in the gender reversal of the two characters. As Ellie wakes up in the dominant role, Peter is emasculated as he serves breakfast. This conflict manifests itself as one of the screwball's most recognisable trademarks, fast-paced, witty dialogue. Guess who was in it? Santa Claus. Candy. The near constant barbs between the two leads facilitate both their initial dislike as well as their eventual attraction. 
You can see further examples of this in films like His Girl Friday, in which investigative reporter Hidley Johnson is shown to be the top of her game, but she's still subservient to her ex-husband, whom she eventually remarries. Walter, you're wonderful in a loathsome sort of way. Now, will you please be quiet just long enough for me to tell you what I came up here to say? The plot of It Happens One Night can essentially be boiled down to a road trip, taking the characters on a fish-out-of-water journey of self-discovery. What's key in the narrative is that both the characters are from urban centres and they face the trials of the countryside in order to learn about themselves. The dichotomy between the country and the city can most closely be seen in the difference between Ellie, who is used to indoor plumbing, outside, and the women who are lined up for the shower outside. In the early part of the 20th century, there was a growing tension between the city and the country. From the late 1870s to the 1920s, America saw the population of its cities explode from 10 million to 54 million. The city offered Americans a shot at upward mobility and a chance to achieve the American dream, but it came at the cost of a quickened pace of life and a perceived lack of traditional American values. In It Happened One Night, along with the screwball comedies it influenced, the main characters' lives are defined by the newly emerging American metropolis, and a return to the countryside came to represent a return to common sense and an appreciation for the things that are truly valuable. Expanding on the theme of city versus country, It Happened One Night also established the themes of characters from two social classes being thrust together and having to work their way through a problem. In a screwball comedy, the misunderstanding of social codes and accepted convention escalates the plot, but it also serves to bind the two characters together. Ellie, who is used to getting her own way, is left stranded when she falsely assumes that a bus will wait for her. Driver. I'm going to be a few minutes late. Be sure to wait for me. Oh, yeah? Yes. Meaning that she's forced to travel cross-country with Peter, who requires her to win back his job. The first and perhaps most obvious influence of this theme was that in the mid-1930s, America was still in the grips of the Great Depression, and the screwball comedy could offer an escape through some of the most charming and photogenic actors in Hollywood. They presented worlds where adventure was around every corner and all of life's problems were easily solved, where romance was real and the hard-working got what they deserved. But more than simple escapism, the screwball comedy reflected the day's attitude towards economic inequality. Through the conflict between the rich and the poor, they show the everyday working classes as more honest and more moral than their wealthy counterparts. This is perhaps most visible in the Philadelphia story. Screwball comedies often imbued their protagonists with a cynicism that was affecting the working poor throughout the 1930s as a result of the Great Depression taking away their shot at the American dream. The young, rich, rapacious American female no other country where she exists. At the beginning of It Happened One Night, Peter is fired from his working class job as a reporter for a New York paper, and throughout the film, he belittles Ellie for her wealth. He says that I'm spoiled and selfish and pampered and, and, and thoroughly insincere. Oh, ridiculous. Ironically, by the end of the film, when the two marry, Peter joins the upper classes, showing that while wealth can be toxic, it's still highly aspirational. Not every screwball comedy has wealth as its central conflict, but it's a theme that's repeated in films like Bringing Up Baby and The Philadelphia Story. Gender-swapped versions appear in My Man Godfrey, and a similar trope of gold diggers being forced to choose between their true love and a wealthy suitor would be seen later in the genre's life cycle. The overall takeaway is that while wealth is nice, it's an inadequate substitute for love, and money will never guarantee happiness. Film theorist Andrew Saris described the screwball as a sex comedy without the sex. In 1934, a strict production code meant that the overt sexuality of pre-code films like The Public Enemy now revealed itself as innuendo, symbolism, and metaphor. You see, my father was a sexagenarian. He was? Yes, he admitted it. A sexagenarian, eh? Yes. Yeah, but we can't put that in the paper. Well, why not? Oh, you know how they are, sex. Well, then just say that he was 60 years old. Is that what that means? Of course. Although nothing is mentioned outright, Ellie Andrews exploits her sexuality to flag down a ride 
where Peter's machoism and charm had failed. Although a version of the MPPC was developed as early as 1922, 1934 was the first year the code was strictly enforced and it changed the form and the content of all films released between 1934 and 1968. It was a strict moralist set of guidelines that forbade crime, violence, and above all else, sexuality. The screwball comedy emerged as a strong push against the code. It was an attempt, sometimes thinly veiled, to sneak subversive and sexualized images and ideas past the censors. Direct sexual advances became physical abuse and verbal tirades. Holy jumping catfish, you drive a guy crazy. And dirty jokes became puns and metaphor. Well, get behind me. I am behind well, you. get closer. I can't get any closer oh. now. Now you ready? Yes. Shall be calm. Left foot first. All right. The screwball comedy was built from the sexual frustration of being unable to touch or express your true desires. When the protagonists of It Happened One Night are forced to share a room posing as a husband and wife, the film uses a hanging bedsheet and the biblical walls of Jericho as a metaphor for moral decency. As the film goes on, the sexual charge between the two builds and builds, and with it a sense of frustration until the two were legally married and therefore able to be together in a way that satisfied the motion picture production code. And thus, the walls of Jericho are toppling. Send him a telegram right away. Just say, let him topple. Ironically, as much as the genre pushed against the limits set out by the Hayes Code, its existence relied on the very boundaries it enforced. Moving towards the 1960s, more and more sexual imagery became acceptable in film, and it became virtually impossible to enforce the code. In 1968, the MPPC adopted the rating system as we know it today, and it ushered in a new age of adult content in cinemas. The sexual frustration that the screwball comedy relied upon was impossible to achieve in this new era, and it felt almost completely out of relevance. For elements could still be seen scattered throughout almost every modern rom-com. In their dialogue, I assume you're a carnivore. <laughs> oh, Mr. Massey, you have no idea. Their relationships and their overall style. And even though by some standards, the screwball comedies may seem a little dated, they stand as a masterclass in how to imply relationships, fears, and attraction. They're symbolic of cinema moving forward towards more complex stories, and they give us an unparalleled views into the fears, attitudes, and hopes of the early 1930s. An interesting experiment would be to do a similar reading of the screwball's closest living relative. What can modern rom-coms tell us about society now? What do Her or 500 Days of Summer tell us about love and life in the 21st century? When comparing a screwball comedy to a modern rom-com, how much has really changed? Hey, thanks for watching 100 Years of Cinema. My name's Charlie. I want to say a massive thank you to everyone that supports me on Patreon, particularly my latest supporters. That's Matthew Gilliard, Bridget Pellerin, the Obscurely Irrelevant Podcast Network, and Tom McDonnell. Thank you so much, everybody. If you like this video and you want to check out some screwball comedies for yourself, my personal favourites are His Girl Friday and The Philadelphia Story. Let me know your recommendations, along with any other thoughts, in the comment box below. If you're already pretty familiar with the screwball comedy and you want some further reading, I recommend checking out the screwball comedy and film noir, An Unexpected Connection. It's a book that I took quite a lot of research from for this video, and you can find an Amazon link in the information box below. The Patreon exclusive video this month is a brief history of the Hayes Code that made the screwball comedy possible, and you can find a link to that, as well as to a page that will allow you to support this channel by clicking just here. You can subscribe by clicking here, and you can check out more of my videos by clicking over here. Thanks for watching, and stay tuned for next time, where we'll be looking at a film from 1935. Yeah, I got a name. Peter Warren. Peter Warren. I don't like it.